So we're going to move from Asia to Europe, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce my colleague Barbara Drake Bain, curator in the Department of Medieval Art and the Cloisters here at the museum. When I first began researching this exhibition, I approached Dr. Bain about becoming a dialogue partner in this development of this topic. And um, that ultimately led to the remarkable series of African and medieval juxtapositions that are in the introductory gallery. Her doctoral dissertation at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts was devoted to medieval head reliquaries of the Massif Central. And her career at the Metropolitan in the medieval art department spans 30 years and half a dozen remarkable exhibitions that uh, range from the Treasures of San Marco, organized in 1985 with the Louvre, and most recently the dazzling Prague, the Crown of Bohemia, held here in 2005 and in Prague in 2006. She has lectured and published extensively on the museum's medieval collections, is a leading scholar on Christian reliquary art, and an author of the exhibition, uh, an essay in the exhibition catalog. She's currently preparing a forthcoming Metropolitan Bulletin that will accompany an installation in the Medieval Hall this December. And the, talk of her, uh, the title of her talk this morning is Pagans and Christians, the Medieval Cult of Relics. Um, good morning, and thank you for that very gracious introduction. His face was animated by such a lively expression that his eyes seemed to fix on those who were looking at him, and the people thought they could tell by the brightness of his gaze whether a request had been granted. Does anyone in the audience think that this quote is intended to describe the face portrayed on the Halloween issue of the New Yorker magazine this year? No? If not, why not? What are the qualities of the image on the New Yorker cover that allow you, first, to recognize the subject, and second, to discern that the artist does not, apparently, see the man represented as our helpful advocate? I may be posing these questions to see if you're awake on a Sunday morning, and I am deliberately choosing image, an image that should resonate with you personally on some level, and as a member of a community of people who happened to come to the Metropolitan Museum today in February 2008. But I am not showing it to make a political statement or to betray my personal loyalties. Halloween is arguably America's favorite holiday, rooted in paganism, embraced by Christianity, and now by secular society. So I think this serves as an appropriate invitation to you to reflect with me about images, about images of ancestral heroes and images of power that cut across culture and time. Because it is easy when images are removed from their original context, to underestimate their transcendent and transformative power, even as we admire them. And it is particularly easy to misread images that a community considers sacred. This is a central premise of eternal ancestors. The exhibition intends that you see everything that Picasso and artists of the early 20th century did in African sculpture, and more. I want to share some images about, share some observations about sacred images in Western Christian art that offer certain parallels to African art and that may therefore support the goals of eternal ancestors in some small way. To the European missionaries, Protestant or Catholic, who first saw the sculpture featured in Eternal Ancestors, 
This was manifestly pagan practice, intolerable idol worship. But what of their own European Christian heritage? Over the last year or so, it has been my privilege to discuss with Elisa Lagama the provocative cultural and aesthetic parallels that we see between African reliquary sculpture and medieval Christian reliquary sculpture created on different continents and as much as a millennium apart. We have looked at the stylized, broad planes of the faces. We have considered the effect of large, shining eyes. We have remarked the glowing quality of the material chosen by the sculptors. And we have admired the quiet authority conveyed by symmetry married to simplicity. Such are the choices embraced by artists working in different times, in different parts of the world, and following the dictates of different creeds. They intended to infuse reliquary sculpture with the presence of a saintly, that is, a highly esteemed exemplar, an ancestor or role model, model who was to be remembered, honored, venerated, and relied upon by the living to serve as an example of behavior and comportment, to be the focus of a shared sense of community, and to be invoked in time of need. Picasso, whose interest in African sculpture was rooted in its formal qualities, nonetheless recognized that African reliquary sculptures are spiritual catalysts, effective vehicles that transcend physical realism. And the same is true of medieval reliquary sculpture. That is why Elisa chose to juxtapose Christian medieval reliquaries and African pieces in the entrance gallery of Eternal Ancestors. And although it is not the first time that ritual objects from distinct cultures have been juxtaposed, I believe Eternal Ancestors accomplished something not achieved before. By way of contrast, I draw your attention to an exhibition held in the winter of 1999-2000 at the Musée National des Arts d'Afrique et d'Océanie in Paris, La mort n'en saura rien, Relique d'Europe et d'Océanie. The show addressed the importance of the skull in European Christianity and in the culture of Oceania. Edgy parallels were drawn between cultures and are reflected in chapter titles in the exhibition catalog, like A Consummate Art, Headhunting, followed immediately by Europe, Headhunters in Oceania, 18th to 20th century. Whatever one may think of museum acquisition policies, it seems to me manifestly absurd to compare even voracious collecting habits to the violence of beheading. Nowhere in that exhibition was any interest shown in whether reverence for the human skull in different cultures created a springboard for the creation of works of art displaying a similar aesthetic. The focus of eternal ancestors, by contrast, is more than sociology. It is also about aesthetics, and about the common threads in the aesthetic choices and in ritual practice and in the belief that fueled artists' creativity. His face was animated by such a lively expression that his eyes seemed to fix on those who were looking at him, and the people thought they could tell by the brightness of his gaze whether a request had been granted. The text recorded around the year 1000 spoke of a reliquary image of a saint called Gerald, a native of the village of Aurillac in the Auvergne. The church dedicated to St. Gerald there, where you see the village on the screen, became a pilgrimage site after the saint's death in about 920. His body was placed in a stone sarcophagus at the left of the church near the high altar of St. Peter. But the Abbey's chronicles also describe an image of the saint of gleaming gold. This was a typical pattern. The honored saint, often the founder of the community, would be interred, but his skull would be separately enshrined. The image of St. Gerald was created around the year 1000 through the generosity of the abbot, Gerald's successor, who donated gold and silver inherited from his mother. And Bernard of Angers, a learned priest who visited the region about the same time, provided the account of his lively expression that I first read with you to you with the Cheney pumpkin. <laughs> 